Welcome back to Capitol Hill Ocean Talk, live from the museum at Capitol Hill Ocean Week 2016. I'm your host, Kate Thompson. Since the late 1990s, invasive Indo-Pacific lionfish have been appearing in the waters of the southeastern United States, the Caribbean Sea, and the Gulf of Mexico, and wreaking havoc. This rapidly expanding invasive species has a voracious appetite and no known predators. But there's some good news. This invader may be malicious, but it's also delicious. So today we'll talk about this venomous animal and how everyone from National Marine Sanctuaries to seafood restaurants are working together to slow the invasion. Today I am joined in the studio by Emily Stokes, the Lionfish Program Assistant for Reef Environmental Education Foundation, or REEF. Emily conducts educational talks and workshops on the spread of invasive lionfish, coordinates the Don't Release Me campaign, which encourages responsible pet ownership, and organizes the popular Summer Lionfish Derby series. I am also joined by my colleague, Dr. Steve Giddings, the science coordinator for NOAA's Office of National Marine Sanctuaries. Steve works with the program scientists to better understand sanctuary ecosystems, track changing conditions, and reduce human impacts. Also joining us is Dr. James Morris, a marine ecology with the NOAA Centers for Coastal Ocean Science. Since 2003, James has been leading biological and ecological assessments for lionfish, and he also literally wrote the book on lionfish research and control. Finally, and last but definitely not least, is Clara Proctor, Operations Manager at Edible Invaders, an innovative food company known for their delicious lionfish dip, which we may get the chance to try later in the show. So we're gonna have some fun today because we have some amazing things to show you. I'm gonna have Emily go ahead and hold up one of our small lionfish. And then uh, Dr. Giddings, could you grab the big guy, Can please? Oh. Right. <laughs> Look at that sucker, <laughs> holy crap. So obviously there's different sizes of lionfish as you see here. Quickly, give me one word that describes what you see here. Emily. Venomous. Steve. I see a warning. James. Invasive. I see lunch. Lunch. <laughs> Woo! Thank you. You guys got to put those down. So those were all different things to describe a, you know, very invasive fish. But we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, the invasiveness of them, the research done on them, and then how we can potentially mitigate against their impacts. So I'm going to go ahead and start it off with you, Emily. You know, what is a lionfish? They're pretty ugly creatures, at least sitting here on a, on a plate. <laughs> yeah, they are ugly. Um, they are native to the Indo-Pacific. That is where they're originally from. They are a member of the scorpion fish family. Uh, they're related to the turkey fish that are found in Hawaiian waters. Um, they are venomous, and, uh, but they are popular aquarium fish. Uh, they're very beautiful when they're smaller, <laughs> and uh, they have really beautiful fanning pectoral fins, so people really like them in aquariums. And we believe that's how this problem all got started, is that people kept them in their aquariums um, in Florida, and uh, they're a bit temperamental, so they dumped them into the ocean and started this invasion. Oh, wow. So, James, I mean, if they're in the United States oceans, you know, I don't get it. I mean, why is this such a big problem? So this is a, lionfish are a problem because they're an invasive species. We know that invasive species um, can, can wreak havoc in, uh, in ecosystems in which they invade. We know this from um, introductions of kudzu and zebra mussels in the U.S. and um, snakeheads and, you know, name your invader. We're ha we have an invasive species problem in the U.S. Unfortunately, we have invasive species problem in the marine environment now with lionfish. Lionfish is a reef fish. Um, before lionfish, we had no experience with understanding the impacts of invasive marine reef fish. Um, but over the last uh, 15 years, we've learned a lot. And, uh, and one of the things that we've learned is that, uh, that a reef fish invasive species is a big deal. It can wreak havoc in, uh, in reef fish communities. And, uh, we're, and we're particularly concerned about impacts in coral reef fish communities. Well, so some of those, those communities are in particular are in National Marine Sanctuaries, which National Marine Sanctuaries, 14 special places that are protected across the United States. And I know that just in the past five to six years, they've gone from being in Florida all the way up to close to New York. So Steve, tell us a little bit about why that's a problem and you know, what is National Marine Sanctuaries trying to do to um, mitigate that problem? Well, the first, uh finding of a, a lionfish in a marine sanctuary is actually at Gray's Reef National Marine Sanctuary off Georgia in 2007 I believe it was and around 2009 in Florida Keys 
and then 2011 at the Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary, and then those latter two, Florida Keys and the Flower Gardens, abundances have gotten much higher quite fast. And we're very worried about how, those, how high those populations will go. We're also quite worried about the species that these animals are eating. They eat a lot more than just this fish we care about, like grouper and snapper juveniles. They eat a whole host of fish from tiny to relatively large fish, uh, half their body size or so they can consume a fish. We saw a lizard fish in the stomach of one yesterday that was uh, wow. over half as long as the fish really? itself. Jeez. So they, they'll eat anything. Mm -hmm. And that's the problem. And in sanctuaries, we care about everything. Well, if they're eating everything and we care about everything, well, we have a conflict. So in marine sanctuaries, we're trying to do something about it by controlling uh, and understanding better by funding and supporting research in sanctuaries and educating and doing outreach efforts to get the public to help us solve the problem because we know it's pretty much out of control and it's going to take everybody's effort to make it, uh, make it better. Well, Emily, I, I'm a diver and, you know, growing up, I always thought of a lionfish as being scary and poisonous and it's going to kill me if, if I touch it. So what are some of the myths that surround lionfish? Yeah, I'm glad you asked. And um, the first one does have to do with poison versus venom. Um, lionfish are not poisonous, but they are venomous. And the difference is that poison is ingested and venom is injected. So they have 18 venomous spines. Um, there's 13 up here, dorsal spines, and then one on the leading end of each of their pelvic fins and three on their anal fin. They, the meat of lionfish, however, is perfectly safe to eat. Um, as long as you don't ingest the spines. <laughs> um, and um, another misconception that we do have and that we hear about often is uh, people going out and diving and then feeding those lionfish off their spears to our native predators. And uh, the thought is that that will train them to then go and catch their own lionfish and help us with this problem. But really it just trains them to see us as a source of food, um, which can make for some uncomfortable situations when a shark comes around and is <laughs> sniffing your lionfish catch. Um, so we want to, and it also can negatively affect our native predators. They are venomous fish. They do affect our predators. So we want to keep those healthy as right. much as we can. So James, uh, you know, understanding these myths, I and mean, these are in the United States, and we've just kind of taken this charge to try to learn more about them. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about some of that research that's been being done on lionfish? Sure, absolutely. Well, with this fish, we really didn't know anything about it. Uh, you know, we had no experience with it in, in the Atlantic. Uh, there was a little bit of research that was done in the Indo-Pacific, of which we were able to draw on, but but it was scant at best. And so we, we had, in the beginning, had to uh, to do biological assessments. You know, we need to learn about um, the growth rate of this fish. Um, we need to learn about, we had to learn about its reproduction. Um, we need to learn about its life history and, and things like that. And we found some really astounding facts about this fish, which, which really explain how this fish has become such an invasive species. Things like they reproduce every three to four days, year round, producing a couple million eggs a year. I mean, that's, that's an astounding life history characteristic that has facilitated undoubtedly part of this invasion story. Um, the, the biological assessments quickly transitioned into ecological assessments and learning about um, how consumption of native fish on, on our reefs are changing our reef biodiversity. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and that's been a very, very uh, important work. We've had to partner with um, folks uh, in academia, such as uh, Stephanie Green at Simon Fraser University and, and uh, Mark Hicks at Oregon State University, these really um, pronounced, science, pronounced scientists that have done some really good work to help us understand uh, the, the consumption impacts of lionfish on reefs. We've brought this fish into the laboratory. We've done things like build bioenergetics models so that we can understand the metabolism, the metabolic rate of which this, the, uh, the biology of this fish so that we can project um, before an invasion gets out of control in a conservation area, we can work with the manager to predict what the impacts of the invasion are going to be in their area based on their uh, specific biodiversity. So, um, and then today we're transitioning that work to control efforts. How do we control lionfish? Are there parts of their life history or um, behavioral ecology that we can exploit uh, to make removals and control more efficient 
to help to really help the manager right. um, be successful. Right. So I, I know the statistic was at thirty thousand eggs a day or every three days they right. produce something like that, which right. is crazy. And we actually have a, a quick question from our audience on OceansLive.org because you can chat in your questions on both Twitter and on Oceans Live. Uh, and the question is, what is government doing to support or motivate private harvesters who could help? Anybody? Steve? Well, uh, I think you'll find the government's working in partnership with as many people as it can find to help solve the problem right now. We work with organizations like REEF, with research or, uh, entities like the National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science and universities that are studying this problem and trying to work with them to help solve the problem. I've been working with a couple different groups on trap development to see if we can meet the demand for lionfish as food. In that's, the that's well, there's a little an prototype, of uh, this trap. a miniature of the trap I've been working on that's, that gets to what James talked about, exploiting the natural behaviors of lionfish and needing to understand those behaviors better. In the center of that little trap is what we call a fad, a fish attraction device. Well, we're hoping it attracts those fish. We think it does, and James is doing research on various fad designs to make sure that we come up and we put the best kind of fad in the middle of these traps because these are what we call non-containment traps. They drop to the bottom and they open up, exposing the fad to the environment. Lionfish love structure. We do know that. Ask anybody who goes and kills lionfish, they're going to find a, something on the bottom and there'll be a fish there. Right. A chair or a boat or anything. They're all around it. Well, if we can get them to hang out at a fad and then pull the f trap up, close the containment around the fad and bring the whole thing up, then we've started to create a way to meet the demand by getting supply. The problem with lionfish is they go down to a thousand feet deep. Well, divers only go to about a hundred feet deep. So we can get lionfish down to 100 feet deep really well with spears, but anywhere below that where there are lots and lots and lots of lionfish, I promise you that, we're not getting them, except in occasionally in lobster traps and things like that. We need to develop lionfish-specific capture mechanisms that, to work right. in deeper water. Right. So because this, oh, go ahead, Yeah, Ken, I'll just add to that, that um, we've, we've worked hard to try to develop um, tools and approaches that will integrate this fish into our commercial fisheries. You know, we've, we've worked on nutritional labeling, we've, we've developed um, educational videos that, um, that, train, that can train handlers and processors on how to, to, how to handle lionfish. Uh, we've done assessments in terms of taste testing and, the, and working with seafood technology folks to understand the, uh, the sensory value of lionfish compared to some of our existing fisheries. But more importantly, we've also had to understand that we're setting several policy precedents here when you start harvesting commercially an invasive species. Mm -hmm. So we've worked hard to try to understand that and what are the implications of harvesting a, a non-native species in a, uh, commercially. Right. Um, and that, and that's, that's, that's a hard question. Right. Um, and right. there's a, there's a, that's a very difficult um, problem to address. Right. Well, uh, Clara, so we're trying to find these solutions and, and, you know, James was just talking about harvesting and all these other things, but we go back to Emily's myths. I mean, poisonous, right? We can't eat this, or can we? Well, that's what a lot of people think, and I'm so glad, Emily, that you talked about it because the number one question I get asked on a daily basis is, is it safe, like you just asked? It is totally safe to eat. So like Emily said, venom has to be injected into your skin in order to to affect you. We can eat these fish, it's just fine. They're safe, they're clean, um, and they're delicious uh, to boot. So um, it's the problem, the problem is that they are a little bit difficult to get. And um, Steve, developing the trap is innovative and it's creative and it's something new because right now you have to be a diver and an advanced diver and then a hand spearer to be able to get these fish. So they're beautiful and delicious and wonderful and, uh, and people are still so very afraid of them, but they're safe. Uh, we handle them, of course, with care. And then I, I make dip and sell it and people really, really enjoy it. But until we get over those myths, uh, the market is a little bit slow going. Right. Right. However, um, a major grocer is now offering whole lionfish and it's Whole Foods in Florida. So you can just go up to your local Whole Foods, buy a whole lionfish and uh, bring it home and cook it for dinner. 
Right. So I, I'm just going to ask a question. We had a great one from Twitter. Uh -huh. uh, somebody is asking, any way we can get restaurants like McDonald's to serve lionfish? Right. Well, that would be fantastic. But again, until it's less expensive to get them and uh, we can understand more of the control. And thirdly, and most importantly, we can continue to educate um, people. People will enjoy them. They just don't know that they love them yet. Right. So just quickly, I'm going to go back to your okay. dip. Uh, tell us a little bit about how, because I mean, when you fillet a lionfish, I've heard there's a bunch left over. So how do you make your dip? Right. Okay. So that's the whole point of making lionfish dip is, uh, is there's too much meat left over on the fish after you fillet it. So we put it through a magic machine <laughs> and uh, uh, we, it pulls off um, almost 100% of the viable meat from the fish. So, uh, of course, it's mangled when it comes out, so we throw it in some dip and serve it up. Nice, mm -hmm. nice. So, uh, McDip. what's that? McDip. McDip. <laughs> there you go, McDonald's. There's your new one, McDip. <laughs> so, uh, I'm just going to quick touch on uh, chefs. So, I think uh, we had an infographic on earlier that talked about like there's restaurants that are 164 restaurants I think across the United States right now mm -hmm. that are that are selling lion fish. And you just mentioned Whole Foods, and they're and, you know they're selling it at Whole Foods. Also, I know um, you know what what is it? How can we get chefs to be more willing to serve lion fish? So the number one problem I have with chefs is they don't want to pay the price that it costs to get the lion fish from the ocean. Um, chefs are all excited. I get calls every day from all over the country wanting lionfish, and that's wonderful. And then I tell them the price. So uh, until until people like Steve can right. develop a trap, right. we are in this point, this bottleneck, if you will, that it's a high price. But it's not only a high price um, uh, with obviously money, but it's also a high price on the environment if we don't do something about it now. Right. Okay. Well, so. Emily, I'm going back to you because I know that Reef has uh, done a lionfish cookbook. Yes. And what a way to go into Whole Foods, pick up your fillets of lionfish, and use the Reef cookbook to, to uh, make that lionfish. So tell me, uh, tell me a little bit about it and um, what can you find in this cookbook? Yeah, so um, this is actually the second edition of our Reef cookbook. The first one had 45 delicious recipes. Um, we created that in 2010, and this is our latest version. It has 16 new recipes from um, guest chefs all around the invaded region, and there's little um, bios of the chefs on the pages along with the recipes and some great pictures. Nice. So. So I'm going to just go back to the the problem of getting it out there and marketing it. Yes, we know we need to figure out easier ways to catch the fish, but uh, why you know why is it so difficult to market it? I mean, I think that. I mean, goodness, I have these amazing earrings on right now. You see these earrings? They're so, they're so pretty. Um, and they're made from the lionfish themselves. Mm -hmm. You know, what are some, some ways to better market lionfish and, and start people getting people into wanting to use them somehow, whether it's eating them or wearing them for jewelry? So like today, today is a great example. We're just all getting together from all different aspects of uh, the lionfish control community and um, just opening conversations and getting it out there. The internet is a great way. People are learning more and more. But people keep, we were talking about poisonous fish before. People still think that they're uh, like puffer fish, that if we don't handle them correctly, that they will die. And that is simply not the case at all. But you're right. We can use so much of these fish. Like I've got on a little bit of lionfish <laughs> jewelry too. And I think Lorna the lionfish is wearing some lionfish <laughs> earrings too. The lion so fish. we can use so much of this fish to do good. Uh, the, the bones to make a, an, a, um, a gardening um, a substance to, to help the nutrients in your garden. We can use the, the egg sacs to make, um, um, well, we call it, it's lionfish caviar essentially, but it's delicious. Um, there's just so much that a lionfish can offer. We can use the whole body of the fish. We just have to get together and do it. So and conversations it. like this really, really help. Right. I think one of the challenges with the market is convincing um, the professional spear fishermen that this is worth their time to go get because they've been spear fishing their whole lives. I mean, and uh, they've gone down and gotten grouper and snapper and gotten a good price for it. Why would they 
take the time to go seek these out that tend to hide more anyways when they see a grouper right there and they can they can just get that, that and they know the that. price that they'll get right. for that. Right. This market hasn't quite taken off yet and we need that demand from consumers to convince the fishermen that this is worth their time. Well, and also, I mean, a grouper, easy to catch, easy to fillet. Speaking of filleting, Emily, I was wondering if you could kind of give us a demonstration of, guys, this, you, if you know what you're doing, this is actually an easy fish to, to, to make it happen. So yeah. do you mind showing no, us that technique really not. quickly? I can do that. Yay! First cups. time in Ocean's Live history we've ever filleted a fish <laughs> <laughs> on the show. Well, she's setting up yeah. to say something about sure. that price point question. Yeah. Right now, there are places that are serving lionfish in restaurants that, and people are willing to pay a little bit more for the product because they know they're doing some good for the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, but if we can make it easier to get in out of the ocean, and there are a lot of people working on trap designs, so it's not about the, just the one right. I'm working on. Obviously, there's a lot of people doing work on it. And w when we get that magic bullet and drive that p price point down and make it easier for fishermen to buy in mm -hmm. for deep water fishing. Then, uh, then we'll really, it'll take off. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, so, Claire, we actually have a question from Twitter. Mm -hmm. Can you order your lionfish dip online? Yes. Uh, uh, that's um, something I'm working on right now. So look us up on Facebook or on our website, ediblenvaders.com. And I, within a couple of weeks, will have a place where you can order. Wow, look at this flaying. This is a huge <laughs> knife and a huge fish. <laughs> Emily, you're pretty impressive. <laughs> <laughs> it's not too hard. <laughs> so uh, going forward, you know, organizations like Reef and NOAA are working hard to address the spread of invasive species. And I just, um, I don't know if Steve and James, you could talk a little bit, you know, what are we looking forward to in the future of lionfish management? Sure. I'll, t I'll take that. One of the challenges that we have with this is uh, this is an issue that we need to learn from. There's, some few, there's a few things that we need to learn um, you know, as a, as a country or nationally about marine invasive species in general. One is that you know, we need to think about how did lionfish get here in the first place. Hmm. Um, we, know, we know about the impacts of invasives. What can we do to prevent them? What can we do to provide early warning for when non-native species are becoming established? If we didn't, um, could we have prevented this introduction in the first place? We've been monitoring um, other marine ornamental species that have been introduced um, into South Florida waters. And we know there's over 40 other species that we have detected over the last 20 years um, that, have, that, are in, that have been in South Florida waters. They just haven't become established yet. Um, so we need to think about that culturally, about where do these invasive species come from or the things that we can do to prevent their establishment um, and think about some of the cultural changes along those lines. All right. Well, geez, that's a huge fillet. It is. Wow. It's, it's actually somewhat, fish. that's a big lionfish. Yes. They only get to be about three or four inches larger than that. Okay. So that's, that's the biggest they get. This that's is, on the is this big what you see more of, this size This here? is more the average size. You can still get a good size fillet off of the smaller right. fish. They have, I mean, you can see they have quite meaty shoulder areas. So right. Right. you can, this is a pretty impressive fillet. So is that good, <laughs> just, you know, cooked up like that with a little bit of butter and lemon? Dude, you so have good. no idea. <laughs> the <laughs> fish delicious. is a little bit sweet, a little mm -hmm. bit buttery just on its own. Oh. They're just fantastic. Yummy. Eating. I think I've only eaten the ceviche, like where it's chopped up and Raw That's on good a chip, too. But uh, that, that looks pretty impressive right there. <laughs> very, very yummy. Chefs are quite happy with the quality of this meat in terms of its uh, all textures and everything, but right. more, even more, the flavors that it absorbs, which is whatever you want it to absorb, it does. And it's a very, very good, good fish for that purpose. That's that's the kind of meat we like in fish, is fish that can be flavored in many different ways. Well, this is one that can. Can. In, in fact, scorpion fish is a, is a uh -huh. well-known delicacy mm. um, around the world. You know, rockfish on the West Coast is a scorpion fish, similar to what, you know, lionfish, you know, is. We have scorpion fish on the, in the Atlantic as well that are harvested commercially. So we're very familiar with the quality and the taste of this fish. Um, it's just the, the difficulty is in the supply chain right. and how do we harvest it. Right. We, we cannot harvest it the same ways that we think about with our other traditional fisheries. Right. So we have to be more creative. Well, one thing I noticed when Emily filleted that, you notice she didn't cut off the venomous spines. Mm -hmm. There are people that do. Whole Foods does, I believe, yes. because of the risk to c consumers. Mm -hmm. But it's not necessary if you know how to handle a lionfish. So lionfish handling is an important right. skill to right. do, look right. and to develop. I'm pretty sure that cookbook right. has a handling. Right. It thing. does, yeah, it but has the, a whole section. Chefs there. often handle them without removing spines, so they're not that risky if okay. you know what you're doing. It's Yeah, and when you're filleting it, it's going to lay flat, and all of the 
spines are also going to be laying flat against the cutting board or whatever surface you're using. So as long as you're aware of where the spines are and you're just aware, then it's, then it's not, not too difficult. dangerous. So I know also, Emily, that Reef has a management um, solution moving forward in an action plan. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, well, we try to work with a lot of different um, groups and we, we do a lot of different things. We do fun things like our cookbook, which is, you know, helps kind of start the market and get people interested. Um, we have a campaign called the Don't Release Me campaign, which is focused towards um, aquarium owners and just pet owners in general, trying to educate them about the dangers of releasing an unwanted pet into the wild. So obviously, lionfish is a big problem, and pythons in Florida is another problem that was started the same way. Uh, we do educational programs and workshops throughout Florida, um, and we have our derby program. We do lionfish derbies throughout the summer um, where people compete in a single day to bring in the most lionfish possible and there are cash prizes at the end. Uh, last year we, had, we helped with a derby that brought in over 2,500 fish in a single day. Oh, yeah, um, we were um, scoring them for about three hours. But <laughs> so do you um, educate before the derby on how to bring in the lionfish? You know, I mean, spear guns, there's lots of danger going on here. So we, you know, what do you do to, to do that? Yeah, absolutely. We have a meeting the night before our derbies where we go over safe collecting and handling of lionfish. We also have um, a two-hour workshop that I do or that we do at Reef um, that focuses on safe collecting and handling where the spines are, what tools you can use to prevent any kind of injury. Okay, nice. Well, James, what's NOAA as an agency doing about this problem? Sure. First of all, I'd like to um, recommend folks visit the Lionfish Web Portal. We've partnered with um, a, a, some non-governmental organizations like Reef and the Gulf and Caribbean Fisheries Institute to develop a clearinghouse of lionfish information for educators, for researchers, for, for managers as well. And uh, there's a lot of great resources on there. There's educational videos, there's fact sheets, there's myth busters, there's scientific um, references and literature that's searchable depending on what type of research topic that you're interested in. So it's really become a, a, a gathering place and clearinghouse for, for information on lionfish. Programmatically in NOAA, we're, we're working hard in, um, I work in the National Centers for Coastal Ocean Science, part of the National Ocean Service along with sanctuaries. Uh, we're, we're, we're focused very much on how can we help sanctuaries manage the lionfish problem in the sanctuaries. So um, to do that, we're trying to be creative. Uh, we're focusing a lot of energy on trying to understand the behavioral ecology of this fish so we can develop exploitation strategies that will make removals more efficient. And um, you know, we have limited resources to manage uh, some of these protected areas, but we know they're special. And we have a, we have a mandate to protect those special places. And, uh, and so developing an invasive species control plans for those special places, including our national parks and, and refuges and, and other conservation areas, and then being a good neighbor. There are over 30 countries in the Caribbean that have lionfish problems now. Yeah. Um, and, and, and likely this problem originated from introductions in the U.S. or locally in the region. So we have a good neighbor responsibility here to help with management of lionfish on a regional scale as well. And uh, so those are, those are high priority areas for us. Um, it's, every day is a, a new learning experience with this invasive species. We've learned a lot, we ha um, and we hope to have a you know, larger impact going forward. Right. I should, can I say something? Mm -hmm, I should sure. say James understates his influence in this problem, really. He's worked with a number of different countries across the Caribbean to develop similar plans that he helped at the Marine Sanctuary Program develop to respond to this problem. So he helped to help myself and Michelle Johnston down at the Flower Garden Banks and others in the other sanctuaries to put together a response plan for flower gardens that focus, uh, focuses on research, monitoring, control, and education. Great. So there's, those kind of things are happening right. across the region. The problem's still not solved, so you can see how big a problem it is, yeah. but everybody's trying very hard, and we think the solution is in the, the whole bite back concept. Right. <laughs> Eat them. Eat every em. bite counts. Eat them. Sure. So speaking of every bite, <laughs> would you like to Clara, try Clara, can I try your dip? Can you test this down? <laughs> yes, please. Sure. And while we're, we're, we're cracking open the dip and we're about to dig into them, uh, you know, these, go these agencies and these um, organizations can't do this alone uh, to help spread the, the, the lionfish problem. But mm -hmm. what can we, you know, as the general public, do to help control the lionfish invasion? Eat them. Eat them. 
we're about to. Let's start right now. Right. Let's I'm, start right now. So <laughs> the, one of the concepts of, of making a dip is it's just so accessible. It's so it, we try to bridge the gap between there's a problem in the Gulf called lionfish, and this is something you can do about it. We just do all the work for you. Whoa, I got to try this. Another so so these are uh, environmentally friendly and responsible spoons. Responsible spoons. This is an mm -hmm. all-natural, gluten-free product. Wow, that's good. Thank you. Yummy. Yummy. And the main One ingredient word. is lionfish. Yummy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it's two words, but whatever. <laughs> no, yummy. How about? Smoky. Smoky. Mm. Oh, yeah. What's your word, James? Delicious. Mm. <laughs> Will you taste the garlic and the onion in it? Yeah, I can. I love it. can. Here, have some more. Oh, have some more. There's have plenty. More. There's plenty. Okay, so I guess, you know, going out of here and, you know, you talked about your lionfish derbies. Steve, you know, good luck on those traps because we want to catch more so we can have more dip. <laughs> and James, you know, keep on working really well with those other countries because uh, I'm looking forward to learning more myself about how other countries are helping us to mitigate this problem. And uh, Clara, you know, good luck selling this because it's, it's, it's great and it tastes delicious. Thank you. And um, thank you so much, all of you, for joining me today in the studio. It was definitely the most fun, <laughs> for <laughs> sure. And uh, thanks, Lionfish, for coming too. So uh, thank you again for being with us. And with Lionfish's 30-year lifespan and enormous appetite, controlling this invasive species can sometimes feel daunting, as we just discussed. But we've, we've seen today that there are some amazing projects underway to help protect our reefs from lionfish. So at 1.15, Chow will turn to the Arctic with a panel on local voices and traditional knowledge for sustainable Arctic economy. We'll be back here at 2.30 p.m. for our final Ocean Hill Talk of the Year. Tune in here at OceansLive.org for a discussion on how visuals and media can inspire ocean conservation. We'll see you then. Thanks for watching.